right. This morning, I'm just going to jump right into it. The name of my message today, you're going to love this message. It is awesome. It is life-changing in ways that are hard to describe. I'm going to talk to you today about the power of tithing. Yes. Yes, some of you got really excited. Some of you are looking for the exits. I know, that's okay. Just hang on. I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to get something to you. The Lord wants to bless you. We've been talking about the abundant life, the overflowing life, and the overflowing life starts with our own heart, a relationship with Christ, our minds and emotions being healed and restored. It moves into our relationships, and then it affects our natural lives. We've been talking for the last several months about the three principles that govern the resources of the world. The laws of God all fit into one of three great principles as it relates to, uh, to finances, money, resources, and the, 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 the material things of this world. And those are the law of work or productivity and diligence that we have to work what God has given us. We have to work it hard and diligently. And the second principle is the law of stewardship, that we have to take care of what we have and be excellent stewards of it and not wasteful. And the third law, and this third law is a powerful, it is an exponential catalyst. See, people who don't know the Lord, if they work hard and they work diligently in the areas that they're gifted in and they take good care of their resources and manage them well and they're good stewards, they will over time generally be blessed and they will generally prosper because these are laws of God, biblical teachings that work because they work for anybody on the earth. But this third law makes it a spiritual principle. It brings it into another realm. This third law is given to God's people that of all that he gives us when we work and as we are diligent stewards, as he brings in income to us, the Lord tells us that we are to take the first of it, the tenth of it, and to set it aside to give it back to him or to return it back to him. That is called the law or the principle of giving and receiving. And if you are just a giver, but you're not a hard worker, you're not going to prosper. If you're a hard worker and maybe a giver, but you're not a good steward, you're going to waste what comes in. And you can be a good steward and you can be a good worker, but if you don't bring in the offering and the tithe, you're not going to experience the exponential blessing that God wants for your life. And you're going to open your life into the enemy because there's something powerful that happens when we take God's word and act on it as it relates to giving tithes and offerings. All right? And the first principle of giving that's revealed in God's word is the principle of the tithe. The principle of the tithe. So we've been starting looking at that last week. We saw that God made the earth, and even though he owns the entire earth and all of its wealth, he gave it over to humans, to men and women, to manage. He said, this is the work of my hands. Now you take dominion over it. You manage it. You develop what I have created. And so we are now to be the developers of the wealth, the resources in the earth. And when we work the earth and we steward the earth, it produces for us. And the third principle is, found in the next chapter, Genesis 4, that we are to bring an offering of the first of what God brings into our lives when we work the earth. And so Abel brought the first of his first uh, born um, sheep. He was a herdsman. He brought the very first that were, that were born and brought them to the Lord as an offering. And Abel, uh, Cain, his brother, brought an offering, but it wasn't the first. And the Bible says God honored Abel's offering and not Cain's. And in this case, it wasn't about the percentage. It was about how it was offered. It wasn't the first of Cain's harvest. In fact, I was reading someone who told me this week that in the Hebrew, it indicates that he brought like the third harvest. In other words, uh, there's some ancient Hebrew sources that talk about the Hebrew here. You know, when, it's sort of like when you have a, 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 you have a vineyard and you crush the grapes, you have the first crushing, that's the finest. Then you have the second crushing of the grapes and then the third crushing, the same thing with olives, the same thing is true with corn. Uh, one person I was reading said that it's, a, it's the cow corn, the leftover corn is what you give the cows. This is what a, a Cain brought to the Lord, the third kind of afterthought what was left. And the Lord didn't respect Cain's offering because it wasn't his first and choicest. And so we see God wants us to bring the fruit of our labors to him 
uh, and, and God will bless it. And so now we move ahead in time and we're going to the time of Abraham. Now, just so that you capture the timeline that we're talking about, and we're going to talk about biblical history. I'm not speaking from a geological standpoint or uh, trying to argue this from, a, from any kind of a scientific or historic scientific background. I'm just saying what the scripture said, okay? Adam and Eve lived, and from Adam and Eve in chapter 1 of Genesis to the birth of Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, 2,000 years pass. Everybody say 2,000 years. We only have a few of the highlights in Genesis 1 through 12. But according to biblical chronology, it's 2,000 years later, Abraham was born. Abraham was born in 2000 BC. Adam and Eve, according to Jewish tradition, 4,000, maybe 5,000, but, probably, but Jewish tradition says 4,000 BC. So 2,000 years have passed since Abel's first offering. And now we have God calling a man named Abraham and he calls him and says, listen, I'm going to raise up a savior who will bless all of the families of the earth. But first, I want to bless you with a family and I want to bless you and your descendants as a prototype of what I want to do for all the families of the earth. And this is how God said it. Abraham, I will raise you up. I will make your name great. I will bring you to a land that I'm showing you and I will give you a family. I will, I will, nations shall come from you and through you and your descendants, your family, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12, one through four. He said, I'm gonna bless the whole world by first raising up a prototype man and a prototype nation or family. And that's where Israel came from. So Abraham begins following God. And as he follows God, he's learning the principles of the Lord. Now listen, even though it's what we call the Old Testament, please don't think it's not relevant to us today as Christians. Because uh, there are certain things in the Old Testament that were specifically written to Israel when they became a nation that we would call the ceremonial, the Levitical law for the nation of Israel, okay? And there's principles that do apply to us today, but we're not talking about the law given to Moses. Moses doesn't show up for 500 years after this. Everybody say 500 years. So if kind of you're picturing a timeline, I wish I had my machine to show you my cool device. Maybe next week. You've got, you've got Adam, 2,000 years. Now think about it. How long was ago did Jesus live on the earth? That's how long it was from Adam to Abraham. 2,000 years go by, Abraham's born. God promises Abraham and raises up his family. And then 500 years after that, which is twice the age of the United States, Israel is taken out of Egypt by Moses, and God begins the nation of Israel. So it's 500 years of Abraham's family until Moses comes, okay? So we're not talking about the law. We're not talking about what God's ceremonial law was for the Jewish people for their national religion. We're talking about a time where God is raising up a man that is supposed to be the covenant man through which the blessing comes to every human, not just to the Jew, to the entire world. That's why the, Old, the New Testament quotes Abraham over and over again and says that we are blessed with Abraham's blessing. Not even Moses' blessing, Abraham's blessing. Because our blessing was founded in the first covenant God made with one human named Abraham 2,000 years after Adam and 500 years before Moses and 2,500 years before Jesus. You got me? Or 2,000 years before Jesus. Okay. So let's take a look. Uh, it says that Abraham... And we, we started this last week, but I'm going to jump into it. So we're going to go right into it. Go to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. I'm being led by the Holy Spirit here. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm just going to announce it. Um, there's so much in my spirit to teach about this that is liberating and powerful that what I don't get to today, we're going to do a pop-up service Wednesday night, a deep dive Wednesday night here at 7 o'clock. 
and I'm gonna jump into some things that I'm not able to get into today concerning the promises of God as it relates to his blessing uh, and his promise for blessing. And uh, we're just gonna have a great time. So don't miss uh, Wednesday night at seven o'clock, come on out. Um, I think we'll have something for the kids, but not a lot of frills. Just, just come and sit in the, we'll maybe sing a song and get right into the word. I don't care if there's 10 of you or 20 of you, we'll just sit down here and talk. If there's a bunch of you, well, I'll stand up here and talk. But either way, we're going to minister the word and follow the Holy Spirit Wednesday night. It's going to be a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost teaching service. All right? I don't care what you're doing. There's nothing on TV better than what I'm going to be doing here on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. I can tell you that. (laughs) Where did I tell you to turn your Bible to? Genesis 13. I knew that. I was just seeing if you knew. Okay. And notice in Genesis 13, God blesses Abram. He obeys the Lord and God blesses him. And there's a specific statement that I want you to notice in this 13th chapter about how God blessed him and that it was, in fact, not only spiritual, but also material. In verse 1, it says, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him to the south. And Abram was very rich. Everybody say very rich. In livestock and silver and in gold. Okay, so separate say it again, he was very rich. Now, he, he was so blessed, uh, so blessed and so enriched by the Lord's blessing that he had so much stuff that his he, people began to fight with each other. Verse 6 says, Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great they couldn't dwell together. They were just, there were just too much stuff. So Abraham had to take his nephew and give him a bunch of his own stuff. To, he gave Lot a bunch of his stuff and then said, you go and you can go pick any land you want. You can go there. So, so this is, I'm talking about blessed, so blessed, he needed to, 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 to divide off some of it just because it was more than, than it, was, it was working for him. Pretty powerful stuff. So, and this is the blessing of the Lord. Now, we come to chapter 14 and we find that Lot now gets in trouble. Uh, Lot, who was Abraham's nephew that divided off from him, uh, Lot begins to, uh, well, he's not fully choosing the best places to live, for one thing. He chose to take his family down to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where he was going to hang out and build his family. It was a really nice, uh, beautiful, worldly place with a lot of stuff going down that wasn't cool. Uh, At any rate, Lot was exposed and so Lot gets invaded. There's like four kings that come together and they raid Lot and his possessions, take all of his family and his sons and his daughters and his household employees and their families and all of his livestock and take it north captive. And so Abraham hears what happens to his nephew Lot and Abraham says, uh, no, we're going to go get it. I love the fierceness of Abraham. So his house, so his, his employee staff is over between his children. No, he didn't have any children. Between his, uh, his steward and his household staff, he had over 300 people that were working for him to maintain everything he had. Basically his entire, we could say his, his employment crew. And they all went and attacked. They were not fighters or warriors, they attacked these kings, defeated them, got all of Lot's family and employees back, all of his material wealth back, plus in the ancient world, if you defeated somebody, if they took your stuff, you got to take their stuff. So he got the plunders of war, which means he got more than Lot's stuff, he got to take all the stuff he wanted from the four kings. So Abraham is coming back loaded. Everybody say loaded. I mean, he is loaded. And he, he, gives, uh, he gives Lot back his stuff. But notice this, on the way, as he comes down south through the southern central route from the northern part of Israel, he comes through the Judean hill country, and he comes through this little region that rests between the northern end of the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. And it's a region that's up in the hill country, and there's a little town on a hill surrounded by seven hills, almost like a a setting for a diamond ring. And on this little hill, in the middle of these other seven hills, we could say a small, they called it a mountain, but it was like a big hill, there was a little town called Salem, which means peace. Later, this town Salem was to be known as Jerusalem, the city of peace. And in this little town called Salem, sitting there 500 years before God raises up 
Aaron as a priest and even creates a priesthood, there's a priest. Not only a priest, he's a priest of the Most High God, El Olam, the God exalted above all else. There's a priest that knows God and not because of Abraham. There's a man that got a revelation of God and God made him a priest. He wasn't born a priest. He didn't come from a lineage of priesthood. There wasn't even a priesthood in place for 500 years. There wasn't a law. There's just this man who God puts in the middle of this little town that knows God and is a priest of the Most High God. And as Abraham comes down that southern route, the, I know the route. In fact, we've traveled it to Israel. I'm planning a trip right now to Israel and Egypt. And when I announce it, you're going to want to go. We're going to go up that northern route, and you're going to get to see exactly where Abraham rocked because it's the exact same path that has been walked for over 3,000 years. And as Abraham comes down, he begins moving around, probably through the Kidron Valley, around this little outpost called Salem. The priest comes out to him. Let's keep reading. Verse 18, Genesis 14, 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High. That's all we know in chapter 18. And he brings two things, bread and wine. Bread and wine, symbols of covenant. And it says, and he, this is Melchizedek, blessed Abram, and he said this, blessed be Abram, Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Don't miss this. Abraham is loaded with stuff. He's got 300 household employees carrying or pulling all of Lot's families and employees, carrying and pulling all their stuff, plus all the stuff he took from the slaughter of the kings. I mean, this guy is loaded. And as he comes by, it had to be quite a sight from this little outpost. And as Melchizedek comes and sees this man with this, it had to be hundreds and hundreds of people and who knows how many thousands of flocks and, and, and camels carrying gold and silver and all kinds of things. He sees all of this retinue. One man owns this. And as he comes by, the king of the Most High God comes out to him and blesses him. And he said, blessed is Abram of God Most High, Notice these words, who is the possessor of heaven and earth? What is he saying? God owns all of it. He owns heaven and he owns the earth. And you have to understand in Hebrew thinking and ancient Eastern, that means he owns your stuff. We have a disconnect. We think of paper when we think of money. We don't think of stuff. We don't think of flocks. We don't think everything came from the earth, was of the earth. So when there's much in the Bible where it talks about the Lord will bless the land, bless you and the earth, and the earth will yield. That's promises of material blessing or job prosperity. And so here this guy is saying, bless, he owns everything. He owns heaven and he owns earth, which means he's saying to Abraham, God is blessing you who owns heaven and owns you and everything that you've got. Now notice what Abraham does. And it says, and blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. God is blessed because he's the one. This is important. He's the one who gave you all this. He's the reason you have what you have. He's the reason he delivered your enemies into your hand. It wasn't you and your wisdom and your great skills and your great battle plan. It's not because you read the art of war and uh, put all your household employees through Krav Maga or that you, you know, trained them all in jiu-jitsu and you, can't, you didn't have any great threat. You just, you went forth in faith and it was God. God is the one who gets the credit for the victory. He's the reason you got all this stuff. He's the reason you won. Blessed be Abraham, who owns everything, and blessed be God, who's the reason you have victory. And notice what it says, a few little words, and he, that's Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Now, this is the first time the word tithe is used as we understand it. First We've learned about the fact that God wants the first of our material things. When we bring something in, we bring him the first, not the leftovers, the first. God cares about the first. Now we're learning something else, that there is an actually a holy percentage. And Abraham, not because the law told him to, 
out of his heart, he gives a tithe. Now, the Hebrew word tithe means tenth. Everybody say tenth. And it, it, you can't tithe 2%. That's a tip. Not even a tip, really. Right? Um, a tithe uh, is not 12%. You, that would be a 10%. The, the tithe would be the tenth, and then 2% would be the offering. Right? Not that God doesn't want, if you only have a dollar, you give it to the Lord, it's not important. It's just what I'm capture, want you to capture is it's the word for tenth. When you say tithe, you're only really tithing if you're giving tenth. Okay? If you're not giving a tenth, you're giving an offering or you're, you're, giving, you're giving something, but you're not tithing. Tithing means a tenth. It can't mean anything else because it is the Hebrew word for tenth. Everybody say tenth. Swallow hard and say it again. Tenth. Okay. Ten. Mm -hmm. so Abraham brings him a tenth off the top and we know it's first because he just got it and and here's what I want you to recognize this is what's so important in this principle Abraham didn't tithe to get blessed he was already blessed his tithe wasn't an effort to try to get God to bless him. His tithe was offered in thanksgiving and appreciation because God had already blessed him. We don't tithe so that we can, it's not like a, a, a get rich quick scheme. Tithing is not some way, that, a method we use to get God to give us more money. Tithing, actually, God blesses first. And this is what I want you to realize. Before you give God anything, before you bring anything to God, God already gave it to you. And so you're already blessed. Before Abraham blessed the Lord with his tithe or blessed Melchizedek, God blessed Abraham with a blessing. God already said, blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessed of heaven and earth. God already gave him a blessing. The blessing precedes the tithe. We tithe because we've been blessed, not because we're cursed and trying to get uncursed. That's important. It comes out of, Abel brought the firstlings of his harvest. He already had something. If you don't have a harvest, you can't tithe. You can only tithe off what has come into you that you have worked or produced with the work of your hands. When that comes in, you take the first, and it is now the tenth, and you bring it to the Lord. Now, in this case, it's brought to a priest who exists before a priesthood, and he receives it. So there's a man who's receiving the tithe. This tells us something about tithing. Tithing goes to someone who administrates it that is a representative of God. The first tithe wasn't, wasn't given to, to, uh, to a poor person. That's almsgiving in the Bible. It wasn't given to a project uh, to build uh, wells. It was given to a minister, a minister that exists before there were ministers, a minister who mysteriously happens to be here 500 years before God establishes the ministry. Now go to Hebrews chapter 7 because the identity of Melchizedek is revealed. Now if you look at the Jewish sources, there's a lot of writing in the ancient Jewish world about the importance of Melchizedek, who he was, this, this divine human figure. Some said he was an angel, an angelic figure. I don't know that he was an angel. He certainly carried a tremendous power and anointing to be, uh, to be just receiving from the patriarch blessing. But in the New Testament, we have some information about Melchizedek. In chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and priest of the Most High God. And when Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. And Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. And the name Melchizedek means king of justice, king of Salem, and it means king of peace. Now, look at verse 3. There's no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors. doesn't mean he didn't have any. It just means there's no lineage. A priest always has a lineage. No beginning or end to his life. We know nothing about where he came from or what happened afterwards. So he remains in Scripture a priest forever. Read this next part. Resembling the Son of God. In Greek it says, like unto the Son of God. In other words, in the Old Testament, he is a priest just like Jesus. 
It's like Jesus shows up in the Old Testament. Now, there's some who actually teach and believe from this passage that this was Jesus in what's called the theophany, which is a difficult thing to describe, but he was in a pre-incarnate form manifesting himself to the patriarch. And I don't say that that's impossible, but I don't want to jump to that necessary conclusion because I don't think the point here is that he wasn't human. I think the point here is that this was a man who was literally representing Jesus and Jesus was in this human. Before Jesus was in his body, when he was born in Bethlehem, Jesus and his ministry, his purpose, his blessing was present in Melchizedek. And so Melchizedek is this guy that just hangs out in the Old Testament. Nobody knows what to do with him, where he came from, where he went, how he fits into the story. He's just there in the pre-Jerusalem Salem, hanging out, priest of God most high. And he just happens to know when Abraham's come, he just happens to come out. And this priest who we know nothing about blesses the greatest, most blessed person on earth outside of Jesus in all of history, Abram, who's the father of all blessings for Jews and Gentiles alike. And he just is made like the most high God. He's like resembles Jesus. Jesus is with him and in him. And notice it goes on to say, consider how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he'd taken in battle. Now the law of Moses... 500 years later, required that the priests, who are the descendants of Aaron and Levi, must collect a tithe from the rest of the people who are also descendants of Abraham. Remember, people talk about, well, the tithe is for the Jews under the law. That came 500 years later, and yes, the Lord endorsed it. But this is prior to that. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tithe from Abram, and Melchizedek placed a blessing on Abraham, who had already received the promises of God. And without a question, the person who's given the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. Now, that means Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Look at the eighth verse. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are, because we are told that he lives on. Now that's interesting. In the Greek, the word Melchizedek isn't mentioned. And so I want to read it, a translation that's closer to the Greek. Now listen to this. This is the New King James. It's, it's very good. It says, here, we could even say here on earth, mortal men receive tithes. It really doesn't say in the Greek priest. It just says men, human men, men who die, receive tithes. But there... He receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Now, who is the one of whom it is witnessed that he lives? What is the message of the Christian faith? Jesus is alive. What is he saying? He's saying that Jesus was present in Melchizedek receiving tithes from Abraham and that even today it is humans who, who collect or receive the offerings of the tithes, but there... It is Jesus of whom it is witness that he lives. What does that mean? It means that when we give tithes, when we bring them to the people who are doing the work of God, wherever his house is, where his people are taught, where the, where the work of the Lord is going forth, we're, yes, there are humans that collect them, that administrate them. Even Melchizedek was a human that collected them. And certainly, how many of you know Jesus doesn't need it? Turn to somebody and say, Jesus doesn't need your money. No, he doesn't. He, 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 can, he can do anything he wants to do the way he wants to do it. It's not that the Lord has a deficit and your tithes are going to help him. It's that tithing is a way to bless you. Tithing is a way that you recognize that everything you possess is God's. And when you bring the first tenth to the Lord, you're saying, Lord, all of it's yours. Now the tenth, like that tree that, I wouldn't, that Adam and Eve weren't supposed to touch, I'm not going to touch it. I bring that to you, and I bring it, in this case, to a mortal man who's a priest, a minister, who administrates that for the work of the Lord, but it is Jesus who receives it. There he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Jesus is the one who receives and is, is blessed by the tithe. So when we tithe, you're not tithing to a church, even though you bring it to the local church God's called you to, uh, and, and, and that local church has to steward those resources. But 
Spiritually, you're bringing your tithes to Jesus and you're saying to the Lord, Lord, I recognize you have blessed me. This is important. Tithing is not something we start when uh, we are trying to you know, get blessed. Tithing is something we do because we recognize that whatever, we've, whatever came into our lives, all of it comes from God, and the first part is his. So we're going to take the first tenth and not consume it. We're going to bring it, and we're going to offer it for the work of the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to live on the 90%. Here's your tenth. And in giving you this tenth, I recognize you gave me all of it. Did, are you capturing what I'm saying? The blessing comes before the tithing. The tithing is a response to the blessing. We tithe because we're thankful, because we're grateful, because we recognize that the paycheck we got, even if it wasn't very much, even if we still have more bills than we have money at the end of the week, all of it that we have comes from God. And so we're going to take the tenth and give it to the Lord because we're going to recognize God can do more with the 90% when you give him the 10 than you can do with the 100%. People, and you know, God asks for us to give certain things to him. For instance, God asked for one day a week. One day in seven is a Sabbath. We're to keep it holy. We're not to do any work on it. Because God said, if you'll take one day and not work, I'll make the six days so prosperous that in the six days you are working, you'll get more than if you had worked seven. But if you steal the seventh day and you don't give it to me and honor me by worshiping me on the Sabbath and by resting in my presence and celebrating my goodness, then the other six days will not go as well for you. And, and, and I'm going to tell you something. When you steal God's time from him, you steal the Sabbath, you will pay it back. With sick days, you'll pay it back. With unproductive days, you might as well give God one in seven of your time. God can do more with the six days when you give him the seventh day than you can with the seven days. God can do more with the 90% than you can with the 100% percent when you give him the 10 percent. Now in chapter 15, God says something to Abram, and I want you to see this. There's a little, there's a few verses after this where Abraham is not going, he makes some commitments about how he's going to, uh, what he's going to do and with, with those resources that he has. Uh, but notice in verse 15, it says in verse 1, after these things, specifically after this specific tithing event, this moment where he won and he gave this tithe to this priest, Melchizedek, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision and said, and this is interesting, the Lord speaks to him and says, do not be afraid. Now, why would he be afraid? The guy just went after five kings and defeated them. But see, he was afraid. You don't say don't be afraid unless there's a reason to be afraid. What was he afraid about? I just suggest to you that it's in the text. After these things, he said, don't be afraid. I think that after he had tithed, Abraham was experiencing some troubling thoughts. Possibly, you know, have you ever tithed? And then after you, you, you brought your tithe, it was like, oh my, what did I just do? Right? How am I going to make things happen? And the Lord is speaking to him. There's another thought here too that, of course, the kings could come after him and try to take what he had just won back because that's kind of what happened in antiquity. That's how things happened. So Abraham is thinking, how am I going to defend all these new things that I have? And the Lord appears to him and says, don't be afraid. Everybody say, don't be afraid. Now notice these next words, for I am your shield. The word shield here is defender. I am the one who will defend you and your exceedingly great reward. Now, the word exceedingly great is a Hebrew word that means to rapidly multiply. To rapidly, it's actually kind of a Hebrew word from which we derive the word abundant. It's too suddenly, it's like something suddenly just growing, 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 rapidly increasing. Now, the word reward here, um, it's a safe word, but actually the Hebrew word for reward is the Hebrew word that's always translated wage or salary or pay. It's a word for specifically monetary or material salary or wages. What is God saying to him? He's saying, Abraham, don't be afraid after having tithed, 
for I am your defender. I am your shield. I'm going to defend the stuff that I just gave you. I'm going to protect it because you tithe. I'm going to put a watch over that. I'm going to keep the devourer from devouring that because you honored me. And then he said, and I am your exceedingly great reward. I am your rapidly increasing wage, salary, finance. You're going to get paid. You're going to get paid well. You're going to get paid back, and it's going to grow exceedingly fast. He's ta- I'm telling you, I can prove it biblically, theologically, and linguistically. He's talking about material things. Abraham and any Jew reading this would have understood it in the Hebrew. He was talking about, I'm going to bless you financially. Remember, the Jews don't have this kind of dark ages idea that money is somehow evil and we shouldn't have it. That was invented by the church so the church could get the money from the people who lived in Europe. Um, the, 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 the biblical understanding and the Jewish people had no problem making or earning or appreciating wealth because they knew it was part of the covenants. Jesus didn't say we shouldn't have stuff. He said we shouldn't make it first like the Gentiles. We shouldn't seek it. We shouldn't make it our God. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to use stuff to comp- accomplish his purposes. It's all about what you're following, what's first. And so he said, I'm going to be rapidly increasing. We could say, don't be afraid. I'm going to defend what you have. I'm going to be your shield over your whole life and finances and everything you've got. And your rapidly increasing supply of wage, increase salary and finance. Now, how do we know that Abraham understood that as God is promising him natural blessing? Because Abraham's response what does Abraham say when the Lord appears to him in a vision and says, don't be afraid, I'm going to take care of the 90% you've got and I'm going to rapidly increase you even more? What does Abraham say? What does it matter? Because I don't have anybody to give it to. I don't have, an, uh, I don't have any inheritance. I don't have a son. The person who's going to inherit all my wealth, that's how we know he's talking about money. Because Abraham's response was, doesn't matter because how much I've got or how much more I get because I'm bummed out because I can build it up, but I don't have anybody to hand it over to. Eliezer of Damascus is the next guy in line. He's the head of my household employees. He's my steward. He's going to get it. I don't have any kids. And by the way, God, you promised me children. Isn't it something when God bless you, you say, thank you, Lord, but you know what I really wanted was... The point I'm making is that Abraham's response defines and determines the context, not only the Hebrew linguistically, but his response indicates that Abraham knew that God was saying, don't be afraid after tithing. I will defend what you have left and I will rapidly increase you financially because you tithed. And then and, and God said, listen, and he said, I don't care because I'm going to give it to you. And God says, listen, I'm, go outside, look at the stars. That's how many your descendants are going to be. You're going to have people to give this to. I'm going to fulfill every promise I made to you. And Abraham believed God and it was a counted to him for righteousness. And that all happened in conjunction with the tithing experience. Hallelujah. Tithing is the bringing of your first to the Lord. And it, it's an act of appreciating him for all that he's already given you. It is something that signifies God owns it all. Hallelujah. The Bible uh, then later, oh, I don't have time. I want to talk about Jacob's ladder. Mm. Uh, maybe Wednesday night? Now? Mm-hmm. Genesis 28, look at this. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob is the one that carries the birthright and the blessing. But Jacob was a little nasty boy and he did some things really bad and so he got thrown out of the house. And Jacob is having to go to his uncle Laban's to work for his servant's wages because he was a liar and a thief. And on his way, this is a guy that did everything wrong. He's on his way to his uncle Laban's house. All he has is a knapsack. Just picture a you know, the, just picture a traveling hobo in the 30s with his, with his knapsack on his back, right? This is Jacob, and he comes to this place called Luz, and it's on his way to his uncle Laban's, and it's late. So he lays down, and he puts a rock under his head, and he goes to sleep. And in verse 12 of Genesis 28, it says, As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down on the stairway. And without getting into it, he saw the Lord at the top of the staircase. And the book of John tells us it was Jesus who was there. 
And the Lord blessed Jacob and said, I'm going to give you the blessing of your father Abraham. You're going to be blessed and be a blessing. I'm going to increase you. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to multiply your descendants. You're going to bring my Messiah into the world. Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Here's this kid that just got in trouble. He doesn't have anything to his name, but God appears to him and speaks a blessing over his life. Now, what does he do? What comes first, the tithe or the blessing? The blessing. Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek. Abraham tithed out of thankfulness to to, to Melchizedek, not out of law, not out of some kind of fear thing. It was love and thanksgiving and honor. Jacob gets this promise that God is going to use him to carry on the blessing and that he's going to multiply his flocks, his herds, his family. He wakes up, verse 16, and Jacob said, surely the Lord Jehovah is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also unafraid. And he said, what an awesome place this is. Everybody say place. It is none other than the, read it with me, the house of God, the very gateway of heaven. Listen, there are places on the earth where God's people meet God. And in the Bible, starting here, wherever God's people meet God when they come together, the term house of God is used. The house of God isn't a building, but often buildings are built to house the house of God. The house of God are the people of God on the earth who meet with God, and where the people of God and God meet, there is not only a house, there is a gateway from heaven to earth. There's something, I'm telling you today, I'm telling you right now, you're not in a lecture, I'm not giving you a talk tired of these preachers that are calling their messages talks. It's not a talk. I am giving you a message from God by the anointing and the grace of the Holy Spirit. God is here. Jesus, when we gather in his name, we could be in a cornfield. He's there. We are the house of God when we gather in his name. And when we gather in his name and apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers begin to share out of the anointing of God, that that place becomes a gateway between heaven and earth. And God plans to meet us there. Now, that doesn't mean that you aren't a temple of the Holy Spirit when you leave this place. You're a, you're, your spirit is the house of God. Everywhere you go, there's a gateway between you and God. No question. But when we come together, there is a special house of God. Paul in Ephesians 2.22 said this, For you in Ephesus, the whole church, you are being built together to be a house of God, a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. When we gather in the local church, we become a special dwelling place for God. And there are miracles that happen. There is power that happens. There's life change that happens. You're not just coming here to hear a talk. And thank God for online streaming. And God is present with all those that are watching right now. He's ministering to you. And if you can't make it to a place where there's other believers, in that live experience, this helps you to get connected. But this is not the same as this. You need to be in a house of God, in a place with real people also gathered to hear the presence of God because there's something that happens. We're not diminishing the online experience. It's an excellent support. But there's nothing like coming with the people of God and being under the gate of heaven. And he said, this is the house of God. It is the gateway to heaven. And the next morning, Jacob got up early. He took, listen, the stone he'd rested his head against, and he set it up as a pillar. Everybody said, set it up as a pillar. And then he poured oil over it, which was a sign of the anointing. And he named that place Bethel, which means what? House of God. House of God. Now, this is important. He built something to memorialize the place, and he poured oil on it, which means it's sacred. And even though this is the first building project of a house of God, it was just a stone. It was Jacob's pillow, a stone pillar. But it symbolized this is the place, the pillar of where God and his people meet. And he said, we're going to call this the house of God, and we're going to come back here. And later, this became a place where God met with his people. And he said, this will be called the house of God. And notice this, Jacob made a vow. 
He said, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and he will provide me with food and clothes, and if I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will certainly be my God. Now, it almost sounds like he's saying, okay, God, if you really mean it, then, then if you do those things, then you can be my God. And that's actually not, not that, that's, it feels that way in English, but he's actually repeating what the blessing was that the Lord had already said to him. He said, you said this, you said this, you said this. Okay, then you're going to be my God. Now notice this. He said, and if I return safely, you'll be my God. And this memorial pillar, what is that pillar called? House of God. The house of God that I've set up will become a place for worshiping God. And I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. What does he say? He does exactly the same thing Abraham did. He said, listen, if you will bless me, all I've got is a knapsack, but whatever you give me, I'm coming back here. I'm gonna build a a place for worship here. And of all you give me, I'm gonna bring you the 10th. I'm gonna bring you the 10th of that increase. This is the tithe. No law, it's a response. What came first? The blessing, then the tithe. Jacob didn't even have anything to tithe, right? So he couldn't tithe then, but he made the commitment to tithe. And sure enough, God blessed him. And he came back with herds and flocks. He came back with two wives and lots of kids. And when he came back to that place, he had something to give to the Lord. And he had another experience, another vision. And the Lord blessed him again. So the tithe was a response and a recognition that God owns everything. And from that time forward, God began to bless Jacob naturally. Now, what am I saying? I've got to stop. We'll pick up Wednesday night because I want you to get this in your heart. You don't have to tithe to go to heaven. You don't have to tithe to be a, a Christian. Money doesn't make you. You're, you're saved by faith in the work of Christ. It's his blood. And if you think of tithes as some kind of a legalistic thing you have to do, you're missing it. Tithing is a principle. We take the first of what he brings us and we recognize he's blessed us with all that we have and we bring it to him the first and the tenth and when we do that in faith God promises to bless the 90 percent and to multiply it rapidly and to increase us and this is a principle it's a sacred principle and I want to encourage you if you have not been engaged in this I want to just challenge you to begin to make the Lord the Lord of your finances Maybe you tithe at one time and stop. Maybe, uh, you know, you're giving a tithe sometimes and 2% sometimes. And I get all of that, man. I've been through it. I started tithing when I was less than 16. And there have been times it was really, really tough. But I learned that I would rather live more simply with less and tithe than live more complicated or have more and not tithe. There's something about it that I, it is such a sacred thing. And I want to invite you to consider this as a sacred thing that you would bring the Lord the first and the tenth of what he brings you. And you'd bring it to the house of the Lord wherever you're taught the word of God. We do believe the local church is the ideal place to bring it because that's where the house of the Lord is today. Can I read one last verse of scripture? You asked me to keep going, so all right. Where is the house of the Lord today? The New Testament tells us. 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul writes, and he says, if I'm delayed... I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. That means as a believer in the New Testament, there is a place called the house of God that you have to be in. And there's a way to conduct yourself in it. People say, well, every place is the house of God. I don't have to be in a particular place. Wherever I am, that's where God is. God is everywhere, but not every place is the place where God's people gather to hear his word and to worship him. He was recognizing there's a place in the New Testament called the house of God, and you need to conduct yourself a certain way inside that experience. And then he tells us what the New Testament house of God is. He said how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The what? The pillar and ground of the truth. Have we heard the word pillar earlier? The first time the word house of God is used in the Bible. It's used in reference to Jacob's pillar where he made a covenant with God and God blessed him and he promised out of that blessing to tithe. 
It was made at the house of God. That's why the New Testament says the the house of God is the local church. There's no greater thing in the Bible than the local church where God's people gather. And you ought to be in a church, if you're a Christian, a Christ follower, where you are not just attending, listening to talks. You are engaged as members of that family. You are doing your life there. You're letting God speak to you there. And yes, you should be bringing that tithe, your offering to that place so that you can be fed the word of God and so that the gospel can be preached in all the world. That's why we believe the tithe starts at the house of God in the local church. And it's not a money scheme. It isn't. It's a sacred principle. It's an act of worship. It's an act of thanksgiving. It doesn't save you. It doesn't make you better than anybody else. But it does open up a great blessing in your life. And I hope and I believe and I pray that some of you will capture that. And if you haven't been tithing, that God will give you the revelation and you'll begin to bring that tithe. Say, how do I start? Next time you get paid, move the decimal, do the math. That's it. Will I tithe off my net or my gross? I started tithing off my net because that's all I had faith for. And about 15 years ago, I started tithing off my gross. God blessed me off my net, and he blessed me off my gross even more. But I would say if you tithe off your net after taxes, then when you get a tax return, you tithe off your tax return. If you tithe off your gross, tax return's all yours. I still tithe off that too because I love to give, right? But the point is, don't get legalistic about it, but get sacred about it and, and move the decimal. You got paid 100 bucks, take 10. Bring it, to the, bring it to the house of the Lord. Now, if you give electronically, I want to say this. I give electronically. But when I come to church, even though I've already given through my bank, I release my faith when the tithe is taken. And I release my faith that what was given automatically in that moment, I'm calling for that blessing to come. That's why when we receive offering, we exhort you a little bit, and then we call it worship. We want you to stand and pray and say something over it. I don't have time to show you why that is. And then we worship the Lord with our giving because we believe it's a sacred way of appreciating him for all that he's done. Praise the Lord. The tithe is sacred. It's the first place to begin in your giving. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have faith for that yet. Listen, start here. Start with bringing him the first. When you get paid or something comes in before you spend it on anything else, take a first part of that and bring it to the Lord. If it's not a tenth, just make sure it's the first. But you ought to be moving to the tenth. There comes a point where you just have to jump onto it. You know, it's funny We get charged 3% for our credit card transaction fees. We get charged 10% for this, 10% for that. God asks us to bring 10% because it's his, and we get all crusty about it. If you added up all the fees that you pay for things without even thinking about it, some of you still smoking those cigarettes, six, seven, eight bucks a pack. Half of that is taxes. You got money for cigarettes, you got money to tithe. You got money for vape juice, you got money to tithe. You got money to go to destiny, you got money to go to here and to go there, you got money for those shoes, you got money to tithe. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It'll be difficult. Yes, it will. It's a good difficulty. It's a good thing. If you're going to hurt in any way, you ought to hurt in this way. But it's not a hurt, it's a worship thing. I want to challenge you to begin doing it. If you haven't tithed, if you've been paid and you haven't tithed this week, you can go online and do it today. I want to encourage you. The Bible says, test me and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing, you won't have room enough to receive it. Hallelujah. I'm not preaching something I have to try to practice. I'm preaching what I've practiced my whole life, what our church practices, and what I believe the Lord wants all of us to accept and to practice in joy, not in legalism, and in faith. And what a blessing it will be.